uh, when you want to, uh, first of all, uh, mathematics has to do with the introduction of the study of abstraction concepts. We want to understand what a concept as, uh, can be used for. So that, that's what will be part of our story here. Now, uh, first of all, this subject will be in, within the subject of combinatorics that has uh, lots of interaction with many areas of uh, theoretical physics, computer science, uh, several ar areas of mathematics like uh, abstract algebra, topology, uh, geometry, in fact, most areas of, of mathematics. And uh, our specific uh, subject of today will, does have interaction of these kinds. I won't have time to tell you everything, but I'll show you part of the story. So uh, first of all, uh, combinatorics and with regards to Catalan combinatorics, uh, involves many, many objects. Uh, so here are a few of the objects that, uh, I'm just showing them to you for fun, uh, a few of the objects in which this, um, su the subject of today's talk will, uh, does happen. For instance, if you look at the green part of this figure here, and you count how many vertices there are, you will find, uh, if you do it fast, because I, I won't let the figure here for long, but it's 14 uh, vertices. We'll come back to this 14 in a little while. Now, uh, th to get started, what I'm going to talk about, the word Catalan comes from a specific number sequence. So first of all, I'd like to tell you about uh, number sequences. Uh, number sequences, you know uh, several number sequences. For instance, you have uh, the, the sequence uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And when I mean a number sequence, typically I want this to go on to infinity. And, uh, and uh, if I show you these numbers and I ask you to guess what's the next one, most of you will say 64, but you could have other uh, potential uh, f ways of completing the sequence. So an, a number sequence like this is very useful uh, for many reasons because it helps us find interesting uh, links between subjects and also it, it, it helps us uh, understand uh, f fine notions, fine uh, areas of uh, science where uh, the notions we're looking at occur. So uh, a, a very classical other example is the sequence of, uh, that's called the sequence of the Fibonacci numbers. Uh, many people, uh, if you ask them to uh, give you an example of a sequence, they will either show you this one or this one very often. And uh, there's a whole story. E each of these sequences has a story to it, which is very, might be very short or very long, depending on how uh, frequently this number sequence occur in science. Today's uh, uh, sequence is gonna be the one at the bottom here, the green one. So one, one, two, five, 14. That's the 14 that I mentioned, was mentioning earlier. 4232 dot dot dot. If I if I ask you to guess the next number, most of you won't know if you've not seen the sequence before, uh, because uh, the rule is not as as easy to guess as maybe this one where you look at the number and you see that the number is just the sum of the pre two previous numbers. Uh, so. Uh, so here it's easy. First one is just powers of two. Here it's uh, rather more uh, delicate to understand where the sequence comes from. By the way, this is most probably the sequence that has the that occurs uh, more often than any other in scientific publications. Uh, there's I'll tell you why I can say something like this. Uh, later. 
So that's the, the, these numbers are called the Catalan numbers. So that's the, why the title of my talk is the way it is. Now, let's think a bit more about integer sequences. This is a paper that was published in the communication of the American Math Society, uh, say a few years back, and um, it's written at the bottom if you want. And uh, the idea here is uh, to uh, give tools for people to find information. You know, uh, it's, it's not easy if you, if you want to learn new subjects of mathematics, it might already exist all very well organized somewhere, but you don't know the terminology. You don't know how to state the questions. Where can I find? And then you don't know because you don't have the words. Uh, we're all under the impression that using uh, Google or whatever, uh, uh, engine you can uh, use to search on the web, we all have the impression that we can find any information we want. But that's not true. Because if you don't know the word, the right words, you will never find the information because you don't know how to uh, ask your question. Tell me where I can find, and you don't know the name. Now, a fingerprint in this notion is just something that you don't know, need to know the name. You have something that's easy to detect and you can find the uh, who's the, the bad guy or the good guy using it, the fingerprint. Uh, so there's uh, lots of ways of doing that. It's an interesting question. And uh, the way that I'm going to talk about today has to do with this. Maybe that's the first that was done. Uh, so that was a book that was published in 1973. Most of you weren't born then. And in the book, what you had is just, it's a very boring book. The only thing you have in the book are sequences of numbers, like the three sequences I showed you at the beginning of the story. There are, in fact, uh, more than 2,000 of these. And for each sequence of number, there are references to scientific publication where these sequences occur. So if you want to find something related to a sequence because you're looking at this subject or whatever, you open this book. Uh, that's old technology. You open this book and you just look for the sequence there. And they're easy to find because they're ordered lexicographically. All the sequences come starting with one, two are the beginning. And then later on, those with one, three, one, four, one, five, and et cetera. So Neil Sloan published this. And it was a great success in the research community because people could find new uh, links between uh, subjects. Now. Uh, many years later, so that's uh, 1995, uh, Nielsen received lots of uh, letters uh, where people were saying, I have this sequence of integer that is interesting. It occurs in this scientific paper. And uh, he worked with uh, Simon Plouf, who actually was from our university, was my student at the time. And, uh, and they published a, an expanded version of the first book, now with more than twice as many sequences in it. Now, in 1995, it was also the beginning of the web uh, or web-based things. So uh, very rapidly, all this book became online. So there's something called the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, O-E-I-S. You look this up. And uh, you can use it on the web. You just input the sequence of numbers that you want. And then it opens up a page where everything related to this that was compiled is shown to you. Now, the largest entry in this online encyclopedia, the one where you have the most uh, references to subject is the one that correspond to our sequence of numbers. Now, this is too small for you to read, but it's uh, here you have the sequence, it's one, one, two, five, 14. 
1442, 132. And then you learn that the next one is 429 and it, it keeps on. Now in this, you have lots, there are pages and pages of this. I then just showed you a small part of what is there. Uh, there are uh, references to uh, books, um, paper, published papers and formulas and all that uh, relating to the Catalan numbers. Now that's, so that's the sequence of numbers that we are looking at. And now you know a bit why it's first interesting to look at sequences of numbers and second to understand uh, uh, how they're organized. Now the name Catalan comes from uh, not the region in Spain, but the it's the family name of a mathematician, uh, Eugène Charles Catalan, who was in the uh, who worked in the 19th century. Uh, so that's that's the Catalan comes from his name. Now, uh, as many subject in math, uh, it's the case for many subject in math. Uh, Catalan numbers are not actually uh, were not invented by or considered first by uh, Catalan. They were actually considered first by Euler, uh, hundred, uh, I think more or less, one hundred years earlier than Catalan, and and also uh, where uh, that's uh, if you study math from the point of view of Western society, but if you look at uh, in other places in the world, uh, this Mongolian mathematician was already uh, had already considered the Catalan numbers in uh, more or less roughly at the same time as Euler, uh, a slightly before. Uh, so that's sorry I can't read, but this is has to do with these uh, these sequences of numbers and also others before Catalan had. Uh, studied these numbers a lot. Uh, so Catalan wasn't the first one, but the name has been, has been proposed by someone, actually we know who, I think in the notes I give you references to uh, this historical aspect of the story. And, uh, and then uh, Catalan became the name. Now, we know that Euler was looking at these numbers, uh, so, so like 14 we had before, because we actually have a copy of a letter that he wrote to Goldbach uh, in uh, 1751. And uh, so Euler wrote this letter to Goldbach, and in the letter we have copies of the letter in published in books. And uh, if you can read German, then you can read what the letter says. And inside the letter, he explains that these are the numbers he's considering. He, he explains why, I'll come back to why. And, uh, and he actually gives, whoops, and he actually gives a formula for the numbers. You don't need to read this, you'll, you'll learn later. And uh, even uh, something that is very modern in the way of doing things, it give a, a, a series like uh, we, you learn in calculus, where the coefficient of powers of x are the Catalan numbers. I'll also come back to this in, in a minute. So what does Euler, what, what did Euler do? How did he come up with uh, uh, sequence of, now called Catalan numbers, the 14, for instance, how did he get it? He was considering triangulations of a polygon. Here, the polygon is the hexagon. Uh, next, we'll have seven sides, then eight sides. And so you, you fix the number of sides of the polygon, here six, and you consider all possible ways of, of uh, joining vertices of the polygon by the uh, lines such that each piece that is left is going to be a triangle. So uh, here you have cut up the hexagon in four triangles. And, and in fact, 
if you fix the number of sides, the number of triangles is always the same. So all, the, all these triangulation contain four triangles. Uh, they, they cut up the hexagon uh, in triangles. And, and if you count how many there are, there are 14. So that's the way that Euler looked at this. He said, if you consider a pentagon, you'll get five ways of the, uh, cutting it up a square. You have two ways. You, either you put a diagonal like this or the other way. So that's the two uh, of squares. Uh, now, there are other situations in which uh, Catalan numbers come up. The, the reason I, I want to talk to you about Catalan numbers and Catalan combinatorics is because it comes up a lot in theoretical physics, in computer science, in uh, many, many subjects. Uh, so the, here's another situation totally different than the previous one. So I consider a staircase, the yellow staircase here, uh, if next step would have uh, one more level, so I would have four, three, two, one here, I have three, two, one, so that's a staircase. And inside the staircase, I look at all the ways I can, uh, so th think of these uh, as blocks that are piled up on the corner of a room, and then I want to change the color of a, a few of these blocks. And the rule is if I change the color of one of the block, everything that's uh, closer to the wall or the floor to, of this block is gonna be blue. If I change the color to blue here of this block, everything else is blue. So I want to uh, find every the, the number of configuration, possible configuration where I have changed the color with the rule I just said. So this means that the, uh, you'll have something like a pile of blocks that makes sense. And if you count this for this configuration, you find 14, the same 14 that we had before. Uh, now you might think, oh, but that's okay, that's fun. That's just two instances, but there are hundreds of situations where you have different combinatorial objects, you count them, they, they, they're they grouped by some rule, you count them and you find the Catalan numbers. That's why part of the reason why it's, it sits inside this long entry of OEIS. Uh, let me give you a, a third example just for fun. So these are called dick pads, or you could think of it as mountains, a mountain range uh, that you look from afar and you have steps that go like this and steps that go like this down. So you want uh, a configuration of a sequence of up steps and down steps. And it starts with an up step you're not allowed to go below the horizontal line and you want to start at uh, level zero, go up, up, down, up, down, up, down, and finish eventually at level zero. You're also allowed to come back to zero along the way. So these are all possibilities of such configuration where you have four up steps and four down steps. Uh, and yet again, there are 14 of these configuration. I could go on for a long time because uh, of a, there's a, an entire book uh, of, uh, I guess uh, it's in my, uh, oh, I, I, I can go and get it among my books. Oh. Sorry, I'm here. I'm just picking up the book. Oh, okay. So uh, it's it's a thick book. It has uh, 400 pages and more. And all this book is about Catalan numbers. So how can you tell a story? 400, and th this is not a, this is an interesting math. 
400 pages of sto a, a long, long story of how Catalan numbers maybe uh, occur. And it's not the only book. Uh, I have another one I'll show you in a minute. But also it's fun. It occurs in literature. At least uh, Lewis Carroll has it in some of this story, lots of other story. And it plays a crucial role in the science fiction novel, The Chiker Guide to the Galaxy, where there's a computer that uh, works for millions of years. It's the size of a planet. It works for millions of years. And at the end, it says that the answer to all questions in the universe is the number 42. And 42 is one of our uh, Catalan numbers. So even science fiction tells us that Catalan numbers are Okay, so that's not very serious, but let me uh, go on with, uh, so that's the other book that I was mentioning, Catalan Numbers by Richard Stanley from MIT. Now, uh, this is interesting for what you have, uh, uh, the problem session of Thursday has to do with problems that come from, uh, at least in part, Richard Stanley. So Richard Stanley at MIT, so that's Richard. And uh, he has, uh, for a long time in his graduate classes, he has been uh, posing a, a problem uh, that has to do with Catalan numbers. And then he decided to publish recently, a, oh, so this was in his graduate advance book before, but he decided to publish a book only on Catalan numbers quite recently. So if you open up his, his graduate class book, that's not from the, the, you see, so that's a section of a problem. And each figure here, the first one is triangulation of polygons. Uh, I didn't talk about others, but the, uh, the Dick Pat story is one of these two. And uh, there are other stories. So there are pages and pages of this, and the problem is the following. And uh, it's, it's down below in his book, and he mentioned that there are 66 uh, instances that, that's, if you turn pages and pages, you see the actual 66 uh, com mathematical configuration that come up that are counted by Catalan in his book. But then, uh, it, with time, many more happen, and at, at some time, there were at least 207 instances of mathematical notions where Catalan numbers would come up. And now the problem is the following. So you have two sets of objects, uh, my right hand and my, uh, so that's my right hand and that's my left hand. You have two sets of objects, and e each of them, oh, by the way, th uh, that's a Catalan number, five. So even we uh, exhibit Catalan numbers. So you have a Catalan number object here, Catalan object number here, and you want to prove that the, the, these two families contain the same number of elements. So it's easy, you do a bijection between the two. So you just show that you construct a, fun a function that translate each of the objects on one side to an object on the other side. With my hands, it's easy to do. And if you were able to do that, uh, you're able to construct a bijection, you've shown that the two families of object have the same number of construction. So, uh, for instance, you have uh, take the polygon with 16 size, sides and you count triangulation of it. It's going to be the 16th number in the sequence of Catalan numbers, it's going to be quite big. And then you count the staircase where you have 16 uh, levels uh, or 15, 15, 14, blah, 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 up to zero, and you count the number of things that are sit inside it, and it's going to be the same number. To prove that it's the same number, you would like to have some rule, some very 
clear rule that translate triangulation into uh, uh, objects that are my piling of blocks that I had before, or you want to do the same between triangulation and uh, the mountain uh, paths that we, we call thick paths before. So that's, that's part of your, your problem session. Take the objects that are considered and find an explicit way of translating the objects of one family into objects of the other family, and you should be able to move back to go one direction and the other. That's a bijection. So, Carolan numbers. Uh, first thing we we may want to have is a formula. So here, here is a formula. So the nth Carolan number is one divided by n plus one. And this is one of the classical notation for binomial coefficients. So these are the numbers that occur in the Pascal triangle in the middle. Uh, if you want an explicit formula, uh, when I write n k uh, with parentheses around, it's n factorial divided by k factorial multiplied by divided again by n minus k factorial. And factorial, just in case you don't remember, is just a product of all the numbers from n to one, but you don't need one because, because multiplying by one doesn't do anything. And zero factorial is one, and one factorial is one. So you put this here with some number n, and you find the n Catalan numbers. For instance, with four, you would get the 14 by, uh, so above you'll have the product of all numbers from a to two, and below you'll have twice the product of numbers from four to two and a five that comes from this term here. Now, just proving that this formula will always give you a positive number, positive it's clear, but that an integer is, you need to do something. Because here it's some quotient of two things. Now, the binomial coefficient, we already know that they're integers because there's the Pascal triangle. If you don't remember, it doesn't matter. But uh, but you're further dividing by something. So you might get into trouble if you cannot actually divide. But you can. So that's a, a formula for Catalan numbers. And, uh, and that was already. Uh, you can't read this because it's too small, but that's a portion of the letter from Euler to Goldbach, and he actually had stated slightly differently uh, the formula that is here. But he also had something interesting from the point of view of uh, technology of combinatorics. Uh, uh, take all these numbers, the Catalan numbers, and put them in an infinite series uh, where the variable z, you don't really mind what value it is. This is just like a, a formula, a way of writing down formulas and call this cz. So if I give you a, a formula for what this is, you can extract from it using a classical uh, Taylor series expansion, you can extract from it values of Cn. And if you do this, actually, there's a nice formula for what this is. It's one minus the square root of one minus four z divided by two z. So if you take this function and expand it using calcula basic calculus techniques uh, as, a, as a series, around zero, you'll get that the, the coefficients of the series are, maybe it's still too small, but it's one, one, two, five, 14, blah, 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 the Catalan numbers. And uh, Euler also had this in his uh, letter. Now, how can we get something like this? 
there are I'll, I'll show you I won't explain everything I'll give you uh, one explanation without details and then I'll give you one with more details so what you do is so you're supposed to count triangulations of a polygon now it, I'll I want to uh, give a recursive description of these triangulation. Recursion is, uh, uh, you know, that computer, they're essentially machine that ca do calculate recursive things. There's a mathematical theorem be behind this. Uh, so uh, when you use a computer, you're using recursion. Uh, Recursion is a way of cutting up a problem into smaller pieces where you are able to solve the problem because uh, it makes the, as you say, suppose I have solved the problem for smaller pieces, then I know how to solve it for bigger pieces. So let's do this here. And to do this, I'm going to uh, use a, a, a pool table. So I'm gonna hit the, so you see I hit the, the polygon in a way that broke it in two and I get two pieces. This was too fast. So let's do it again, uh, up. So I'm gonna, I have a pool ball here I'm going to hit it like this. It strikes the polygon, breaks it in two parts, and then each of the parts is a polygon that I, for which I can consider triangulation. So here it goes, puff, it breaks, and then uh, decompose it in two pieces, two problems that are smaller of the same flavor. I redrew things so that it would look nicer. So that's if you, you could exploit this to find the formula that I had before, but I'll do it with another approach using a recursive decomposition. So here is one of these mountain paths that I, we had before, and I'm, I'm decomposing up, uh, the path in some way. So you're, this is going fast through the calculation of why uh, we have um the, the formulas of before so let's go back a bit a bit so you start with a, a, a range of mountains and a range of mountains is uh, a range so a sequence there's a first mountain the second mountain the third mountain and i define a mountain to be the first time it comes back to zero now if you have a sequence of things and you want to count them uh Combinatorially, it corresponds to the, uh, the series one over one minus something, the something being what you want, uh, the counting how many mountains there are. So this is giving you a formula, and uh, I'm showing this very fast, but the point is that uh, you get an equation this way. So a range of mountains is the same as one over one minus one mountain. If you expand this series, you get the, uh, this guy to the power zero, plus this guy to the power one, plus this guy to the power two, plus this guy to the power something. And a power something is the number of mountains that you have. And a mountain is, uh, is like a mountain range, a sequence of mountains, but you move it up a bit and you put something before and something after so that it looks like a, just one mountain. And that's the Z here. Okay, I, that's, I would need to explain to you more if I would have to do this correctly, but uh, uh, all this can be made very uh, mathematically precise. Now, once you have this equation, that's, so this is the series of uh, Catalan uh, numbers. When you have this once you have this equation, you can solve it. So let's solve it. So you just do this, and then uh, 
you multiply and you write it if you want this way. So it says that uh, this series that you're looking at is equal to one plus z times itself square. And then, or if you want, you can write this down as uh, one equation c square one plus z c square minus c equals zero. And then you solve for this. So th think of this as a big Y. And uh, this is a quadratic equation. And when you solve it, you get this expansion. So this, the, that's the formula for solving an equation, a square equation it comes from this. So that's what Euler did. Now, if you want, you can look at, there was a, a function that was occurring in this story, uh, one plus z something square. One plus z something square is uh, very interesting. It plays a, a, a crucial role. And if, if you repeat this function, now I'm just explaining what it means to repeat a function. You have a function and you take the function, calculate at x, or the function calculate at its value at x, or the function calculated that the value of the function calculate that a value of the function calculated at x. So that's what's called an iterate of f. And if you do it for x squared plus z, so this corresponds to uh, essentially what we were looking at earlier. And this has been publicized in many instances, you'll recognize something that you've seen before here, because if you do, if you do this, you, I'm gonna calculate the function here at zero, it's z. Then I'm gonna iterate it twice and calculate it at zero. So that's z plus z square. And then I'm gonna calculate it three times, f of f of f of z, of z, of x, sorry, and then put zero, and that's going to give me z plus z squared plus 2z cubed plus z4. And, and I can do it four times. And when I do it four times, I see slowly occurring, appearing 1, 1, 2, 5. And now it's 6, 6. But if I could, could keep doing it, this up to infinity, I get um, the uh, sequence that we were looking at. And, and studies of how this go, converges has to do with the Mandelbrot fractal that you might have seen before. So, uh, so that's the the, the kind of number occur in this uh, very different way. Uh, yet again. Okay. So I've been talking for a while about kind of numbers. And you might wonder if, uh, and I could, could could do that for a long time because I told showed you books where this happens. And if I would be in an advanced math class, I could uh, talk to you about links with abstract algebra and and abstract topology and uh, many many subjects of math. Um, also, I could explain links to theoretical physics and, and all that. But what I'll do is uh, slightly change the subject or make it bigger, larger, more inclusive. And, uh, and also, this will give you uh, some challenges for uh, Thursday. So there's a, a generalization of, of Catalan numbers that's called FUS. So that's the German double S. So uh, we might write this F-U-S-S, Fuss Catalan numbers. So Fuss, who was, was he? Fuss was uh, Nicolas, Nicolas Fuss. He was the uh, assistant of Euler. So Euler, when, at the end of his life, had, uh, uh, couldn't see well, so he couldn't write his math, so he, he took an assistant to help him write down the maths that he wrote. Now, Fuss, 
uh, became part of the household of Euler and eventually married his uh, granddaughter. So it became family. Lots of uh, families in, in mathematics. Don't ask me my own family, how many P we are in that would be a too long story. Anyway, uh, so Fuss uh, learned about uh, what Euler had done and wrote a paper, this is in, in Latin, but it says that uh, rather than cut up a, a polygon into triangles, why don't we try to cut it up into larger pieces, squares, for instance, or four-sided polygons? So you take a bigger polygon and you look for how many ways they are cutting it in pieces that are uh, have four sides or five or six. And he, he counted the numbers. So this is way before Catalan still. And he counted how many there were, and he even came up with a formula where uh, R here is uh, one in the case of uh, triangles. And in the case of, of square, it's going to be two. In the case of, of cutting up into pentagon, it's going to be three. So you have. A, a, a whole new bunch of uh, numbers that generalize the Catalan numbers of before. So you replace R by any numbers bigger or equal to one. And uh, so that's uh, way before Catalan. Remember that the pub paper of Catalan is 1838. So that's uh, roughly uh, 50 years uh, before. And uh, it was published in, in this uh, uh, journal. And, uh, and we have copies. And we can see, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we can read it off. And he was nice enough to put, give us tables of numbers uh, where the first column here is the Catalan number. And then if you cut it into polygon of size four, size five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so uh, we have the, the generalization that he was considering. So uh, just to make it a bit bigger so that you can see them. So that's the sequences that Fuss was considering. That's the Catalan sequence and that's cutting up into squares and pentagons and and you keep on like this now for there are formulas that I, there's a formula that i mentioned uh, you could write the series and try to uh, guess so if if you have access to maple mathematica or sage uh, computer algebra systems you could just for fun, try to find what's, how do I get a series such that the coefficient are given by these numbers? So that's also a fun exercise if you want to try. Uh, so uh, now there are uh, analogs of dig paths. Now I'm going to draw them in a different way. So I'm going to turn them both like this and uh, so the horizontal line is now like this so you if you you have to look at all this like this to recognize what we had before and uh, and uh, that's the the path a path is just a sequence of south and uh, east step of length one uh, with a diagonal like this and uh, the side of the rectangle are uh, n like this and rn uh, plus one n like this and uh, rn on this side. So, and you look at how many paths like this there are that stay below 
the diagonal line. So I presented it this way because then it's easy to, to show the role of n and r. So if you put r equal to one, you get a square shape and, uh, and a diagonal like this. And this corresponds to some of the things we saw earlier. Now, if you count the number of these, you get the numbers that were considered by Fuss. In. And, uh, and now one ch challenge, and I'd never seen this really uh, done explicitly, is to try to translate these construction into, so I mentioned two things here. I mentioned that this corresponds to uh, like a, mountain range of earlier and i mentioned that it that uh, fus had the polygon decomposition so but uh, one thing that you could do if you had access to one of the books that i mentioned earlier uh, i mentioned that there are 207 combinatorial configuration that give rise to the catalan numbers can we do 207 configuration that generalize to the context where you have some value r here, fix r, say two, and uh, do all the construction and the bijection. So you, you can take your, the problem that you're gonna solve on Thursday and multiply them by infinite, an infinite number of possibilities by choosing r. So each of your problem on Thursday that has to do with looking at the Catalan case uh, gives rise to infinitely many problems. So you should have something to, to occupy you for the rest of the summer if you're bored or uh, you cannot have fun because of COVID things. Uh, at least you have something here. And uh, I can go on with the in even more general context, I won't talk too long about this, but uh, so now I, in the previous slide, I have height n here and I had r n. And some of you bright people have uh, maybe thought, why should I have a multiple of n down here I could put any number and that's what I'm doing now. So you have height n and you have width m. Now, uh, so this is a, an even more general context. Uh, you can uh, wonder uh, now the tr triangulation of the polygon here, I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, at least this construction makes sense here. And uh, you might wonder, can we find formulas? Now, there are two, we already know formulas. We, I've shown you formulas before, but uh, in the general context, finding formulas is not easy. It's easy if, oh, easier if these two numbers, the height and the width, are what's called relatively prime. Their greatest common divisor is one. Here, this is not the case here. I didn't, don't remember one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, eleven. Yeah, maybe it is here. Uh, but when uh, there's a common divisor for the height and the bottom, actually we had examples with common divisors before, but they were in a sense easier. But if there's a common divisor between the two, then the formula is more complicated and not easy to guess. But if uh, they don't, the greatest common divisor of M and N is one, then there's a nice formula. 
so uh, you consider, so let me be precise of what, what I'm doing. You consider the rectangle like this. You have the diagonal of the rectangle and you consider all the paths that go south and east that stay below. They're not allowed to cross the diagonal. You can look at the largest shape that sits below the diagonal and call it the, the staircase. So here, this is not what I drew, is not the staircase. Let me uh, draw the staircase maybe. Um, it would be like this. So that's the staircase in green. So, and that's what this is. And I consider all paths that stay below that staircase. And you can calculate the, uh, what these points are by uh, a simple procedure is the floor you multiply m times n minus k divided by n when you are at level, uh, so zero, one, two, three. So that's the k here. And uh, you can calculate the this quotient, take the floor. This is gonna give you the length, horizontal length of uh, where this down step is. So, and uh, and then you count how many there are. So that's the problem now. And uh, <clears throat> for this, in general, the formula is complicated. Uh, and uh, where this comes from is very a, a long, long time after all of these previous uh, guys that I mentioned. And once again, this is maybe impossible to read for you, but uh, that's a, the paper that I know that has the longest title that I've ever seen. Everything that's here is the title of the paper. It reads something, derivation of a new formula for the number of minimal lattice paths from zero, zero to KM, KN, adding just contacts with the line, blah, 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 blah. So that's the title. I've never seen uh, such a long title before. And it was written by a, a mathematician called Bisley. Uh, I'll write this down soon. And, uh, and this, uh, and when you read the paper, it gives formulas for instances and all that. And that was published in 1954. So that's way after all the others. And now this paper, at least in the combinatorial community, was not known. I, lots of people that I knew didn't know about that paper. Uh, no one saw it. Maybe one of the reason is because it was published in something that is not a journal that typical people in math read. It was pu published in Journal of the Institute of Actuary of, of the London Math Society in 1954. Uh, I mentioned earlier that these Kalan numbers occur in many areas. Uh, at least in one of these areas, this paper was known, not the people in, in actuary, actuarial studies, but more uh, in the, the people in uh, probability theory. So some of these people knew about it, but the combinatorial community didn't. And they discovered most this af probably after the year 2000. So now we're getting closer to you because you were, many of you born uh, and during that time. Uh, so, and, uh, and it, so the, the more, most general context was considered uh, quite recently. 
and uh, and the formula that Bisley, uh, I'll show you the formula that Bisley obtained. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be complicated, uh, and I'll sh explain a bit more after. But uh, and one of the reason it wasn't found fast is because there's some rule of the thumb for finding formulas. So let's, before I show it to you, the suspense is there. So you, um, you want to know when a sequence of numbers has a nice formula. This is a inter very interesting problem and there are general theories about this that are, uh, would take me a, a long time to present to you, too long for one hour. Um, but uh, in this, uh, so there are techniques that can find formulas. And these are included in some of the computer algebra system that you have. You, you can input some, uh, first terms of a series and ask the computer to tell you, can you guess the formula? The way it does is it uses very interesting calculation that I won't tell you about, but and it's not it's not by looking up some bank of, of formulas. It actually does calculation, and but the rule more or less is that this will be successful more often when the numbers that you look at when you decompose them into prime numbers you get lots of small prime numbers. If you get suddenly a big prime number occurring, it doesn't work. Now, this happens here. So, uh, if, if you look at the cases of uh, the generalization I, I just showed you for general rectangles, um, so when the greatest common divisor of the two sides is not one, you, uh, many instances, you see big prime numbers occur. And then you don't know how to do a deal with that. But uh, Bisley explains why, in a sense. So that's his formula. So let me parse this formula for you. So I'm counting the analog of Catalan numbers for a rectangle with sides A, D, B, D. A, D is the, like this and B, D is like this. If you switch, it's the same. Now, it's a sum. Now, that's the reason why you get it, it's not nice because there's a sum here. Inside, the number of terms in the sum have to do with the greatest common divisor of these two numbers. So that's the height and that's a, a width of the rectangle. You look at the greatest common divisor of the two, you, have, you will have some, a sum of, of things uh, depending on, on D, the greatest common divisor of the two. So the greatest common divisor of A, B, A and B is one here, but D is. Now, the index of the summation here is uh, what's called, it goes through the partitions of D. Now the partitions of a number are all the ways of writing this number as a sum of numbers. So the partition of, um, of three, I can write three as three, two plus one, or one plus one plus one. Four, I can write as four plus three plus one, two plus two, two plus one plus one, one plus one plus one plus one. So there are five ways of writing four as a sum of numbers, um, and I, place these numbers in decreasing value because of commutativity, I can always do that. For five, there are uh, seven ways. For six, there are 
11 ways. Just finding the number of ways is not a simple story. So D, the greatest common divisor here, you look at all ways of writing it up as like this. And uh, uh, so that's the sum. And now more things are present in the sum. Uh, there's a division by some integer here. Let's skip that for a moment. Now you look at one of these ways of writing D as a sum of numbers, and you I write K is element of mu. This is just a fast way of writing. I look at all these numbers that occur in mu. For each of these numbers, I do a, a formula that looks a bit like what we had before. One divided by something binomial coefficient of something else. Now, take the case where D is one. Then there's just one way of writing, uh, of writing D as a sum of numbers. So this summation is not there. This number is not there. The product here has only one term. So the formula is going to be like this with k all part, all, all the numbers that are used to write one, but there's just one. So take this formula, substitute k equal to one, and you will have solved the problem when the both sides of the rectangles are. Uh, don't add, don't share a common divisor except one. The only thing that is needed to finish to read this formula is to explain what this is. And uh, so uh, this number is uh, something like this. You have written D as a sum of numbers. It, when you do this, there you might repeat the same number a few times. So these are called C something, C something. CI is number of times you've used I in the ways of writing D. And then you multiply this number. Maybe uh, I could, no, whoops, we did something wrong here. Sorry. Um, so oops again. Ah. We got almost got through the present presentation without uh too many uh, uh technical difficulties. That's uh, yeah, and then you you do some calculation one to the power a number of copies of one multiplied by this number of copies factorial two to the number of twos that occur in the description of the multiplied by this uh, number factorial etc. So it's a it's a some formula that goes here. Uh, maybe what I can do is show you the case uh, d equal two. Oops, d equal two. So you have two a and two b, and I'll keep a and b just because it's nice. That formula that I'm going to write is going to include all possible. So this corresponds to all possible situations where you have a height and bottom of the rectangle where both are even numbers, and uh, but uh, the numbers to by which they're multiply are don't share a common divisor, and then you will have one over two. So that's the z thing, the weird number uh, multiplied by. Uh, what is it now? Yeah, one over a plus b times a plus b a, 
all of this square plus one half of um, one over a plus b times two a plus two b two a. So that's what the formula comes down to when d equal to two. When d equal to three, you'll have three terms like this, and four, you'll have five terms like this, and etc. So, and the proof is not totally easy. Uh, so that's the uh, <clears throat> the Bisley formula, and uh, and now still challenges for you are to see uh, how many configuration or construction you can do uh, that are counted by these same numbers. Explore this. And uh, I don't think anyone has done this in general. So this is something that if you, you need imagination, exploration, and, and uh, you don't need to learn a lot of mathematical abstract construction, although there are lots of abstract mathematical construction linked to this. Uh, there's current research today uh, that I know of that is linked to this in very interesting subjects. And uh, I think that uh, this is going to be uh, the end of my talk. It's one hour on the dot on my watch. Now, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking François Béron for this beautiful lecture. And now, uh, I will also call for questions. Uh, remember that you need to type them in the question, uh, in, in the GoToWebinar question section, and uh, I can read them. So there's, there's already quite a few questions, so I can, I can uh, read a few of them. Okay. Here's a question from Robert Murphy. Uh, if the Catalan numbers correspond to triangulations of two-dimensional polygons, are there equivalent sequences for higher dimensional shapes? Uh, uh, yes, but then the problem becomes uh, dif difficult. I don't. Uh, I know some things about this, but uh, it rapidly become becomes difficult. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, and then th it explodes in many directions. But uh, if you want to look this up, uh, part of the story has to do with the study of what's called plane partitions. And uh, you look this up on Google, plane partitions, you won't find exactly what I'm uh, mentioning here, but it's going to be a start. And, uh, and then uh, it's, it's, there are books written on plane partitions, just to tell you that uh, this is a... And uh, also current things that are going on today. Okay, any next questions? Yes, here's a question from Amitis Hamidi. Uh, can we use uh, a proof by induction in order to prove that all these models follow the same pattern? Or in other words, Wait. the Catalan numbers? Yeah, that's a very nice question. And in fact, uh, there is a way to do it like this very systematic way of doing this, this way. But it's, uh, in fact, Richard Stanley mentioned that he doesn't want this answer because uh, so uh, because he, he'd like to see beautiful bijection, like this is a beautiful bijection between my fingers, very natural in a way. Now. And the other way that you're thinking of is, uh, let me describe it globally. If you know how to, uh, the Catalan kind of numbers will occur in situation where you're able to cut your problem into similar things. Whenever, 
almost all the time when you have a situation where you can cut the construction in two, you'll get the catalog number. I'm almost not cheating. Uh, so if, if I tell you for each of the construction how to cut them naturally in two, then I have two smaller pieces and say this smaller goes with these smaller cases goes with these and these other with these. So I have a, a description. Let me use a word, mathematical word, an implicit description of uh, bijection. And what I'd like you to do in the problem session is look for explicit description of uh, bijection. But it's a, an interesting question and there's a whole uh, field of uh, also stu that study these kind of decomposition and, and property. There are very general theorems about this that I won't tell you about. But okay. So that's the answer to the second question. Third question. Thank you. Third question. Um, there, there's a there's quite a list of questions going Oof. on here. So, <laughs> okay. so here's a third question by Zheng Yang. Uh, how did mathematicians prove the general Catalan formula in 1954? Oh, the one uh, basically uh, is so the so the problem is you have a problem when it returns to the diagonal when you have a path that touches the diagonal. So when the greatest common divisor of the two numbers are not, is not one, the path might come back and then you have to do something uh, special. So when it doesn't, never touches back the diagonal, it's easier. Uh, I, there's a uniform proof uh, that of all these. Uh, that I will not describe, but uh, I, so what Bisley showed was that when it comes back to touch the diagonal, then you have to count, to, to take into account what this does. So that's, the proof is as two parts, one where it never touches and those when it touches and so. I'm, the, I'm not doing a good job of answering your question because I know it would take too long to do, but that's the general picture. Thank you. Now here's a question that's been asked by several people, Siddharth Chopra and uh, Huang Wu, um, and they, they're asking whether there is a nice bijection between the set of dike paths and the set of triangulations of a polygon. That's the, that's exactly one of your problems for Thursday. <laughs> Find this. <laughs> so uh, the problem session, if I answer your question, I'm answering the problem session. So the, the answer is I won't answer. But the, it, it exists. Okay. That's, that, I think that's a good answer. It means you can find the answer yourself with a bit of work, of course. Uh, now a question from Dang Dang. Can you share the connection between Catalan numbers and theoretical physics? Oh, uh, there's lots of things there. Um, one of the, so there's a part of, of theoretical physics that's called statistics, uh, statistical physics, uh, where you can you you have complicated system in physics that are hard to understand because they're too complicated so the first thing you do you simplify them and you replace everything by so you a particle is uh, either a horizontal line or vertical line or uh, you you just simplify the problems v drastically so you get models and now uh, among these models, you, you want, there are several that correspond to considering paths that move in the plane. And uh, you want to count all these paths and give them some weight and calculate the properties of the system by doing an average 
of the weights of these paths. So that's the whole subject. I'm, I'm trying to summarize the whole subject of statistical physics in a few words, few sentences. And uh, inside that subject, there's a uh, lot. So uh, if you want, uh, uh, if you look up statistical physics on the web, you will get examples. Okay. Thank you. Here's another question from Min Seo. Uh, I have a good sense of what a mathematical object is. Can you elaborate more on what a combinatorial object is? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so what is combinatorics? Uh, that's in a sense your question. And by the way, you have a good idea of what a mathematical object is. Uh, this is uh, complicated. Let me say that what is mathematics? Is the science that studies what? For me, it's any abstraction that has a clear definition. So that's math. And it, now, combinatorics has to do with the notion that it's discrete or finite. So any finite mathematical construction, and I didn't define correctly mathematical this, this construction, any finite mathematical construction would be the, have to do with combinatorics. But there are modern general theories of such construction. If you do the construction on sets, then there's a notion of what we call species of structures. And uh, that's something that we uh, constructed in the Montreal School in the 1980s. And uh, there are books on this. And so what is a species of structure? The idea is to define what is a combinatorial construction on finite sets. And I, I underline on finite set, you could do combinatorial construction on total orders on some other, and all of these notions are considered. So that's a long story, made short. Thank you. Before I before I go on to another question, I should at least tell you that there's a lot of very positive comments. For instance, thank you for such an amazing talk. It was so interesting. Thank at you. least one of the members of the audience considers uh, your lecture to be their favorite one up to up to now. Uh, okay. And now a question from Takwei Asai, um, who also says thank you for the wonderful lecture, but. Um, in the lecture, you said that there are many mathematical objects in abstract algebra topology, which have links yeah. to Catalan numbers, which yeah. were left unmentioned. Can you give us some examples of those objects? Ah, uh, I can give you many examples because that's an area of, of investigation that I'm involved with. Uh, it's all, again, you have to know abstract algebra. Now, Abstract algebra, there's one part of abstract algebra in which you study groups acting on uh, vector spaces and, um, and typically vector spaces of polynomials. So you have uh, you polynomials in many variables, you permute the variables and you study polynomials of these kinds and it's within these kind of areas that uh, the Catalan number arise as the dimension of vector spaces. So, uh, and now I give graduate classes on this subject that, and it takes me uh, the whole semester to explain everything. So now, yet again, I won't tell you, but they occur as dimension of very interesting vector spaces of polynomials and algebraic geometry is involved and recently what's called knot theory is involved anyway. So uh, maybe I can point you to my web page. Maybe I, I didn't write a new version recently, but there must be something lying up around on my web page that has to do with this part of the story. Thank you. Another question uh, by Jesus Liceaga. 
Uh, is there a sequence that counts the number of triangulations of a polygon when omitting rotations? Aha. Uh, should, I, should I answer in Spanish? I'm joking. I could, but um, yeah, uh, it's very, so you want to say, if I just look at, <clears throat> uh, there are some triangulation when you, uh, rotate them, you get back the same, and others where they're all different. And uh, this problem of counting, removing, <laughs> removing symmetries is a classical part also of combinatorics. Uh, the most general theory, it's called polia theory. So you use polia theory to do this, and then you can get the numbers that you want. So that's also a short answer for a bigger question. And another question from Leonardo Carmo. Uh, in the generating functions that you used, should we assume that the absolute value of Z is smaller than one in order for it to converge? Okay, so there, the Convergence of these series has some interest for if you want to understand the asymptotics of how, how, how big the coefficients become. But typically in this area, they're called formal power series. And the formal means you never consider uh, problems of convergence. And you even consider series that do not, would never converge, whatever value of Z you give. So it's, it's a sub, it's a part of algebra rather than a part of calculus and analysis. So they're abstract series, a very interesting, and it's a whole uh, subject of this. So that's, so here, in a sense, you could say, it doesn't matter, you just forget about calculus and analysis and, to, and think algebra. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Still more questions. This one is now from Matvey Sirianov. What are applications of Fus Catalan numbers? So it's like uh, Catalan numbers occur. I have many examples, but uh, so typically uh, in all the algebraic contexts that I mentioned, uh, it's once you have given a, disc, uh, a role to Catalan kind of numbers, they, they occur as dimension of some vector spaces, it's quite easy to generalize to other contexts where the Catalan kind of numbers will be replaced either Fus Catalan kind of numbers or the rectangular Catalan kind of numbers of the um, even more general that I mentioned at the end of my talk. And uh, if you want one instance of this is uh, that I'm, been looking at more recently uh, with a group is links to uh, what's called uh, not uh, the theory of knots. So there are knots that are studied and you want to understand it's a complicated story uh, and, uh, and you want to understand what's happening now. All of these generalization occur there. Thank you. Uh, another question related to, to um, a question that was asked before. Uh, triangulations have symmetries. Uh, is there some relation between Catalan numbers and certain groups? Uh, there's... Uh, uh, Pierre Guy could answer part of this uh, because his area of investigation is related to what's called uh, cluster algebras. That's, there are many, many directions I could answer this, but, and what cluster, al there are cluster algebras related to groups. And uh, then there are generalization like this also. So that's a totally different way, but uh, yes, uh, they do, uh, they are related to deep properties of uh, groups that are acting on, on these things. And uh, it's a, an amazing story. 
and it could be the subject of a few lectures like the one I'm giving now. Yeah, at least. Okay. At the very least, I would say yes. <laughs> here's here's some more question. This this time from Yael Didies. Uh, could you say more about the open problem that uh, appeared at the end of your lecture? What is it? So the, what I had in mind is the fact that uh, so you know there's I mentioned there are two hundred and seven and more families of of objects that are counted by the Catalan numbers. Now we've generalized the Catalan numbers slowly by looking at Fuss Catalan numbers and then more general and then even more general, like at the end rectangle. I could even go a bit further, but I won't. And, uh, and now you could ask, the open question would be, uh, can you find such a rich family of example so look at this generalization. You know at least one thing that is counted by this. These are the paths below the diagonal. And now you wonder what are the objects? Uh, let me mention, for instance, binary threes that I didn't mention earlier. These occur in Catalan numbers. So when you look to Fus Catalan, you get ternary threes and now what happens in the rectangular con context? I don't know. So uh, binary trees are something that computer scientists are passionate about. Many kinds of trees they like because uh, they, it's a kind of data structure. So uh, are there specific families of trees that are linked to the enumeration that I mentioned at the end? That would be part of a large number of questions you could ask. There, there, there's a, there are several, I would say, related questions about applications. So one question from uh, from uh, uh, Quang Antrin asking whether there are applications in biology or if Catalan numbers appear naturally in biology. And one from Saira Hura Hussaini Tabe asking if there are other applications in graph theory specifically besides the binary trees that you just mentioned? <clears throat> so, um, this is... Uh, <clears throat> let me take pick one of these things, because that's the application and all, all of it. So, uh, one of the things that is related to Kahan numbers is the number of ways of putting parentheses in the expression. So take you have uh, a plus b plus c plus d plus a. There are several ways of putting the parentheses. The number of ways, Kahan number. Now uh, you, t you now you can go from one of these to another using associativity. Uh, just moving slowly the parentheses from one place to another using a small instance of a plus a plus b parentheses plus c is the same as a plus b plus c with parentheses. Now, if you do this and you start from one way of putting parentheses, say put them uh, all, open them at the beginning and then put the parentheses uh, right, right, the most at the left possible and then use associativity slowly to, in all possible ways to move the parentheses as far right as possible, then you, you get a graph that's called the associahedra. And it's a beautiful graph. And that's the green part of my second uh, picture at the beginning of the talk. I said there was this green objects of 14 vertices that's called, the if you look, put vertices and edges, that's a graph, that's the associahedra. And it's been studied quite a lot. So very interesting. So that's graph theory, one instance in graph theory. And uh, uh, biology, I know less about. But you could think that uh, a path that goes up and down like this is like a, a <clears throat> studying of how often it comes back to uh, 
the horizontal line as some could be considered as an abstract model of a, of a complicated molecule, but not three-dimensional, two-dimensional anyway, a complicated molecule and, and that is wrapped up like this. And you, you'd like to know what are the part of the molecule that are on the boundary. So you have a molecule that goes like this, and then there are parts. So think of the uh, DNA, a long DNA strand. It's all wrapped up. And there are parts of DNA that are active and others not. So maybe they're active because they sit on the boundary of this wrapped up molecule. And understanding this, uh, a simplified, version of this would be to look at paths that go up and down. And how often do they strike the down bottom on average? So that's a possibility. Now, so several people are asking about uh, generalizations of dike paths. For instance, I Minuyan mean, is asking, what if you forbade uh, crossing two lines instead of one, and Siddharth Chopra is asking ah. about generalization in higher dimension, like you're <coughs> traveling inside of a cube yeah. instead of a square. So uh, I'll just stick to the two dimension, not go to high, it's interesting. In two dimension, you could also say, take two lines, and then you take the mountain range model where you go up and down. And suppose that the top line is just like a boundary. You're not allowed to go above it. So you look at paths that stay between two lines that go up, down, up, down, up, down. And if you, can, if you want to count them, it's a beautiful theory. And it, the, there's a, it's linked to the study of some sequence of polynomials that are called the orthogonal polynomials. And these orthogonal polynomials occur all over in physics. Uh, uh, anyway, so there's a, uh, it's called Chebyshev polynomial that occur in this uh, enumeration. You have a quotient of two polynomials that occur when you do the trick of generating series for paths within two lines. And there are other generalizations that have been studied. And the, the, it's a, a huge uh, literature. So you, uh, but the, if you, one way you can explore, you have an idea, you, you have a construction, you compute how many there are of size one, two, three, four, put this in OEIS, and see if it gives back an answer. If it gives back an answer, you have connections to other subjects. That's the way to use it. The OEIS is incredibly useful, whatever it is that you're doing in mathematics. Uh, here's an interesting question from Taku. Well, all questions are interesting. That's not what I was implying. But another interesting question from Taku Yasai. Uh, what do you think would be the reason why Catalan numbers appear in so many parts of mathematics and theoretical physics and so on? Uh, uh, that's uh, essentially, I, I answer this without telling you that it was the answer. Um, one, maybe I'll, I'll do an analogy. Uh, when you study algebra uh, numbers, just uh, the real, the complex and all that. When, what's amazing when you reach the level of complex numbers is that you know that this, in this field of numbers, you have the solution to all polynomial equations. So it's the main theorem of algebra says that any polynomial has all of its roots all of its solution within the field of complex numbers. Now, to go from real to complex numbers, there's just one step. You add the square root of minus one. So you solve the equation x squared plus one equals zero. 
solving a quadratic equation is what gives you everything. I like to say that in combinatorics, this is the same with the Catalan numbers. You're solving a quadratic equation, the one that I showed you in the talk. C equal one plus X C square. Solving this quadratic equation is describing the, the solution of every combinatorial problem where you split things in two. And this is the probably why it's one of the richest uh, combinatorial things. For sure, you could split in three and four and blah, blah, but splitting in two as the richness that is uh, one of the main things. So that's my philosophical answer. It's not a proof, a mathematical proof, but it's more philosophy, but that's it. Okay, next. <laughs> yes, yes, we still have next, indeed. Here's a question from Sonny Zhang, whom we can see right now. So how, how does uh, a combinatorial object uh, that contains the Catalan numbers relate, or how do these objects relate in regard to their generating series, like exponential series, type series, cycle index series? Do they have anything in common? Ah, uh, so all of these variations, a more general notion of series, they occur in when you have uh, groups acting on on things, and uh, for for them, uh, for the what the for the world of Catalan numbers, for instance, this would mean um, that I would have on top of the of a structure, and I would have so take a binary three to illustrate my what I want to say. You have a binary three; it has a shape. Counting the number of shapes is the Catalan number. But if you want to add richness to this, you would put on the labels of the three number, numbers or elements of an N set, if you have N vertices, and then you can switch these elements around. So if you have this situation, then you can talk about cycle index series and, and other uh, more general series, and that's you will have some kind of lift to a more uh, rich, for a richer world of what I mentioned about uh, series for the uh, Catalan numbers. So that's one direction. And there are much more intricate direction where you had, instead of counting objects, one, two, three, you give each of them some weight q squared t cube to okay, and the next one is q t squared blah 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 so you do this for you count the numbers the the objects with weights and then you get beautiful things and that's that's part of the story that i mentioned links with everything that's happening in algebra today but uh yet again it's a uh, a long thing, a long story to unfold. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Maybe another uh, question. If yeah. if you still have uh, a few minutes. I, I, I I'm still <laughs> able to stand. It's okay. <laughs> Here's a question from Stefan Pajan. Excuse me, Pajan Excuse me again, Pajan Niraja. Uh, is there a complex equivalent to Catalan numbers? A, a what equivalent? A complex equivalent of Catalan numbers. Uh, complex number? I think it's complex as in complex numbers, yes. Uh, so I mentioned just in my previous answer there, um, <clears throat> There are polynomials. Instead of 1, 2, 5, 14, you get 1, 1 plus q, 1 plus q plus 2q plus q squares. That's a 5. And then so you, you get polynomials with abstract parameters. Now, when you substitute these abstract parameters by roots of unity, so, so that's the 
these are the complex numbers that sit on the vertices of a regular polygon, you get the interesting things. By the way, it's related to one of the other questions that had to do with counting cyclic uh, triangulation with symmetries. But anyway, um, so there's a, if you want to look this up and links with complex numbers of these things, there you should look up something that's, uh, that's called the uh, cyclic sieving phenomena. Cyclic like, like sieving like a uh, S I E V E, sieve phenomena. If look this up and you'll see complex numbers coming in. End of story. Yeah. Thank you. And perhaps one last question to conclude this, this question session uh, from Leonardo Carmo. Uh, where can we learn about Q analogs? Ah, <laughs> so I didn't say the word, or oh, maybe it's in the notes. Uh, I think maybe the simplest way is just to look it up in Wikipedia, Q analogs. It's got, not going to tell you the whole story by far, but it's going to start. And then uh, you get hooked in, in the subject. And then uh, next step maybe is to program everything in, in uh, Sage, Maple, or Mathematica. In fact, in Sage, it's all there. And, uh, and then start to play around with it. And then it's worse, you were hooked before, now you're, you're it's like a drug, you won't stop. And then you'll learn more and more about it. Eventually, if you don't find enough uh, references, you send me an email and uh, I'll, I can at least give you a few pointers. Yeah. But it's a very fun story, the Q, Q analogs. Yeah. Well, François Bergeron, many thanks again for your beautiful lecture and extensive question session. Please join <laughs> me in thanking him again. Thank you, those that agreed for a camera to be lit up. I am sure many others would have liked to, but you were really helpful to me because you agreed to be there. So thank you.